Chapter 11. When the roof fell down. The rain came first in torrents. The leaky roof leaked more. We ran out of buckets to place under the ever-increasing number of drips. We used our soup bowls, running to empty them over and over again. We lay in bed at night, listening to the tuneful plink, plonk, tink, plop. It was funny at first, until we had to empty bowls throughout the night as well. The roof caved in one morning, when Mother had gone to the village and Lihu and I were splashing in puddles in the yard. There was a sickening creak, followed by a loud shudder, which fed into a resounding thud that sent the hens and ducks squawking into the shed. We spun round to find the inside walls of the house exposed, jagged splinters of wood dangling from the tops. A large section of roof was lying across our kitchen table and our bed. A great cloud of dust wheeled in the air before sprinkling down on us. Li Hu clung to my legs in terror. Then, when the dust had settled, he pointed to our house and clapped his hands. Look, Sian, he giggled. No roof. The roof's all gone. Then he burst into tears. I held his hand and stood there anxiously in the pouring rain, wondering what to do. Mother had feared this might happen. I don't know what we'll do if the roof falls in, Sian, she had said. We don't have the money to get it fixed, and we can't do it ourselves. If only the rain would stop. We could at least patch the worst bits. But the rain didn't stop. It pulled its weight and the roof gave up the fight. I walked amongst the debris to find a broken chair, fragments of crockery and toys in pieces. Even the book I was reading had broken its spine. One leg of our bed had cracked in half, but worst of all, our television, father's pride and joy, had taken the full force of the collapsing roof and was damaged beyond repair. Mother arrived back then. We began to clear up the mess, but we weren't strong enough to remove the larger seats of wood, sheets of wood that straddled the two rooms. I went to the village to fetch help. A team of men left their shops to follow me home, carrying between them a huge red, white and blue striped tarpaulin. In no time, they had removed the remnants of roof and fixed the tarpaulin over the walls. One of them took away the broken chair to mend, while another said he would send his wife with some crockery from his shop. It wouldn't be the best, he said, but we were grateful for anything. Uncle visited us that evening. There was a smugness about him, tinged with irritation, as he inspected the damage then offered to make arrangements for a replacement roof to be built. "'It is lucky for you that I have a good job and the ability to help,' he said to my mother. "'If my brother had not lived with his head in the clouds, he would have seen to it that you had a proper roof over your heads and you would not be in the mess you are in now.' "'We are very grateful to you,' replied my mother, head bowed deferentially. We will try our best not to become too much of a burden. It would be nothing new, said Uncle grimly. When he had gone home, Mother and I sat listening to the rain hammering on the plastic tarpaulin. At length I asked, Why doesn't Uncle like us very much, Mother? She sighed and took my hand. As you know, Sian, your uncle spent many years of his childhood helping to raise your father and being responsible for him. Your father grew up to be a very different sort of person from him, which caused conflict though your father loved him dearly. Now your uncle finds himself responsible for us when he, is not, when he has chosen not to have a family of his own and wants to be free of responsibility. I thought about this and could see that uncle might have reason to feel angry, but we had tried so hard to manage on our own since father died. It wasn't our fault that the roof had caved in. Besides, uncle had always been welcome in our house. We had shared our meals with him for as long as I could remember. Surely the bond of family was stronger than any selfish considerations. "'But he seems to want us to fail,' I said. "'He doesn't want to believe we might succeed,' corrected my mother. "'And he doesn't want to be proved wrong. "'Your father proved him wrong by keeping us fed, clothed, housed and happy, "'despite the fact that he ignored your uncle's advice. "'He can't conceive of being proved wrong again, "'especially by a woman and a girl child.' "'I struggled to grasp what mother was saying. "'On the one hand, uncle wanted us to fail, "'because that was what he expected.' and he had to be right. On the other hand, he didn't want us to fail because he didn't want to be responsible for us. Anyway, sighed my mother, he's paying for a new roof and for that we must be eternally grateful. That night, I lay on the broken bed next to my mother and my brother and determined to work harder still to ensure that we didn't fail. Halfway through the night, the rain stopped. We woke next morning to a beautiful cloudless sky. Our terraces looked as though they had been sprinkled with diamonds, where the sunlight bounced off the drops of rain clinging to our vegetables. Our ducks and hens quacked and squawked relentlessly. 
stretched and flapped their wings as though celebrating the return of dry weather. Lihu cavorted among them, hurling feed in the air, trying to catch some before it landed, singing happily. I know it's going to be all right, I said to my mother, as we weeded amongst our crops and checked for marauding insects. I know it's going to be all right. But it wasn't all right. Several weeks later, we went to market. Our rickshaw piled high with vegetables we had been unable to pick during the torrential rain. We hit a deep pothole in the road. It was enough to break the axle, pitching the rickshaw onto its side. Mother and I were thrown onto the road, amidst our valuable produce. When, when she saw the extent of the damage to the rickshaw, with many of our vegetables smashed and filthy, Mother howled with despair. I put my arms round her while people gathered to make sure we weren't injured. Mother was in shock, someone thought, but otherwise we were just bruised. They collected together those vegetables which had survived the accident, put them back in our baskets, and a taxi driver offered to take us home. Travelling in a taxi, the only car I'd ever been in, would have been a high point in my life if I hadn't been so worried about Mother. It was so hot that the driver wound down all the windows, and it was exhilarating to see the world flying by, the wind tugging at my face and hair. Mother sat shaking, gazing straight ahead of her and not saying a word. I held her hand, squeezed it tight again and again, hoping to radiate some of my own will to survive into her being. But only once did she squeeze my hand back. I took comfort from that and hoped that when we were home she would recover. When the taxi driver dropped us off, he told me I should put Mother to bed. I did as he advised and she made no protest. I didn't like to leave her, but I had to collect Lihu from the village. We returned to find her fast asleep. I was relieved. Lihu clambered into bed next to her, though it was only early in the afternoon. Soon he was asleep as well. Our rooms were unbearably hot under the plastic tarpaulin. I wandered outside, swept the yard, tidied the shed, then took a pile of washing down to the river, even though it wasn't washing day. I sat on the river bank, my feet dangling in the cool water, happy to let my cares drift downstream with the current. Things would get better again. We had managed for nearly a year. Mother was suffering from shock, but that would pass. I dipped Lihu's trousers in the water and scrubbed them clean. Such tiny trousers for such a bundle of energy. Where are you, Sian? I heard him calling. I turned to see him trundling over the terraces towards me. Then he stopped and laughed. Bet you can't catch me, he screamed. I jumped to my feet. Bet I can, I yelled. I galumped after him, making dragon noises, captured him and tossed him in the air. Mummy's dead, he said, as I caught him again. My stomach somersaulted. No, Lihu, I said. Mother's sleeping. Not sleeping, muttered Lihu. I gathered together the washing, took Lihu's hand and climbed quickly back up to the house. Mother was lying exactly as I had left her. She was so still and quiet that it seemed she had stopped breathing, but I felt her forehead to find she was burning hot, a whisper of air escaping her lips. Mother's not dead, Lihu, I said with enormous relief. Mother's not well, but tomorrow she will be better. I prepared our dinner from vegetables that had survived our accident. We waited for Mother to wake up before we ate, because we always sat down together for meals. It grew dark, but still Mother slept. I became more and more anxious, but reasoned that Mother was exhausted from everything she had had to do, that the shock and dismay of the accident had simply been too much for her. A long sleep would do her the world of good. Uncle arrived then, and for once I was glad to see him, for a grown-up to take over the situation. We had an accident, Uncle Bar, I told him. The rickshaw overturned. I think Mother's in shock. Uncle went into the other room and came straight back out again. Your mother has a fever. Run to the village and fetch Wen Shanzu, he ordered. He will know what to do. I ran as fast as I could, terrified now that every extra second I took would lead to a worsening in my mother's condition. Returning with the village doctor, I was frustrated by the old man's slowness. Much as I urged him on, he complained of his rheumatic joints and would not be hurried. I took his bag from him in my impatience and supported his elbow as he huffed and puffed his way down the steep pathway to our house. Uncle welcomed him like a long-lost friend, led him to my mother's side and shooed me out through the door into the kitchen. Bring us cold, damp cloths and tea for the doctor and myself, he ordered. I did as I was told, but was sent away again. Lee, who clung to my legs and cried for his mother, inside my head I cried too. I stood up against the door and tried to hear what the doctor was saying. Could I trust this old man with my mother's life? At last, the door opened and Uncle Usher ushered the doctor out. We'll soon see what sort of a fighter she is. 
said the doctor gravely. The next 24 hours will be critical. I'll be back to see her tomorrow morning. In the meantime, keep her cool with cold compresses and moisten her lips regularly. I wish you a good day. He shook hands with Uncle, who helped him up towards the road, while Lee Hu and I slipped through the door to my mother's side. She lay there quietly, an expression of deep peace upon her face, which concealed the battle that raged inside her. You can do it, Mother, I whispered, holding her hand. I know you can do it. You can do it, Mother. I know you can do it, copied Lee Hu. Wake up soon, Mother. Uncle told us that Mother had a very high temperature and a fever, which it was imperative to bring under control. The doctor had given her medicine to help, but Mother was not strong. She would need constant care for the next few days. He would arrange for someone from the village to sit with Mother that night, and would call in himself first thing in the morning. I was to make up a bed on the kitchen floor and sleep there with Lihu, so as not to disturb my mother. I wanted so much for him to put his arms round me and tell me that everything was going to be all right. For a brief moment he hesitated in the doorway, and I saw the anxiety in his face. I thought he was going to say something more, but then he turned abruptly and headed off home. I couldn't sleep. The woman from the village, Mrs Jin, arrived, took over from me the mopping of my mother's brow and left me feeling useless. I wanted her to be there, in case, but I wanted her to sit in a corner and let me care for my mother. Every so often I would get up from my makeshift bed and hover by the door of the bedroom. Sometimes mother was still and quiet, other times she rolled her head from side to side, moaning and groaning. I didn't know which was worse. At least as she was moving around, even if she was agitated and delirious, I could see that she was alive. When she was motionless, it was hard to tell if she was even breathing. Mrs. Jin tried her best to reassure me, but I couldn't help feeling, fearing the worst. In the early hours of the morning, I finally dozed off. I was woken by an horrendous wailing. I rushed to the bedroom door. Mother was tossing around, arms flailing, legs kicking. A sound like an animal in pain came from her lips. Mrs. Jin wiped her forehead and spoke gentle words to her. Mother was oblivious. I reached for her hand, squeezed it and caressed it. I kissed her on the cheek and was sure I felt her hand respond to mine. At last the wailing stopped, to be replaced by a stillness that mimicked death so perfectly that I thought I had lost her. Don't worry, child, she is still fighting, whispered Mrs. Jin. Go back to bed now. You will need to be strong to help her. I must have fallen into a deep sleep, for when I woke again, Uncle had returned and was talking quietly to Mrs. Jin. Is she all right? I asked urgently, leaping from my bed. She is sleeping peacefully, said Uncle. Oh, thank goodness, I sobbed, and without even thinking, I threw my arms round his waist and held him tight. I was so scared she was going to die. Uncle stood briefly, awkwardly, and patted my head before pulling away and addressing Mrs. Jin. Are you able to stay longer? he asked. Sian will make breakfast and I will call by again this evening. For the next five days, I looked after Li Hu and helped Mrs. Jin to keep my mother comfortable. Gradually, the fever left her. She lay in bed, sunken-eyed and exhausted, but peaceful. After ten days, she was able at last to walk around, though not for long, and I was shocked by how thin she had become. She was very quiet and seemed not to be interested in what was happening on our farm. Uncle had arranged for two men from the village to keep things going, but I knew that we couldn't rely on them forever, and that we would have to take charge ourselves again soon. There was to be no relief, however, from the misfortune that dogged us. A drought set in, and the village men returned to their own farms. The temperatures soared to unbearable heights. The earth began to crack in protest. Our vegetables wilted. When the well dried up, I brought buckets of water from the river, but I might as well have dropped a teaspoon of water onto a desert. Only Uncle could provide a lifeline. He sent us boxes of food and called by once a week. He didn't stay to eat with us and I was glad, for all he did as he wandered over our scorched terraces was to criticise my father for his refusal to take a job at his factory. I wished, how I wished, that we didn't have to be grateful to him, but I began to despair that we would ever be free of the support he provided so unwillingly. Mother seemed unable to rediscover the determination that had kept her going before and the memory of my father no longer seemed to inspire her. She would stand in the doorway of our house and gaze with utter despair at the wreckage of our crops. Uncle was sympathetic at first, but he gradually lost patience at Mother's inability to make any effort to save at least a fraction of our harvest. One evening he arrived and sent Lee Hu and me to fetch fruit from the village. When we came back, we found Mother slumped in a chair, her face harrowed. Uncle had gone. 
I asked mother what was the matter. She stared at me, her eyes shot with pain, but she didn't reply, and I was scared, so scared, for all of us. Chapter 12. A Fragile Read It was four o'clock. I saw from the clock on the wall as we entered the apartment, four o'clock in the morning. All was quiet. Mr Chen opened a door into a bedroom. This is your room, he said. Get some sleep. You will be woken at eight. I nodded and watched the light from the hall squeeze out of the room as he closed the door behind him. Fully clothed, I lay down on the bed, which was more comfortable than any bed I had ever slept on, but whether from hunger or fear or both, I could not sleep. Mr Chen's words buffeted my ears relentlessly. One day you will marry my son. In my mind, I rejected this command over and over again. I was going home. I was going to see my mother again. I wasn't going to stay in this place with people I didn't know. I wasn't going to marry someone I had never even met. How could my uncle do this to me? How could he? I must have dozed eventually because I was woken by a sense that there was somebody in my room. In a spill of light from the hall, I saw a silhouetted figure hovering in the doorway. Then I heard Mr Chen's sharp voice saying, Come away, Yimou, followed by the shutting of the door. Was it the boy I was supposed to marry who had stood there? I leapt out of bed, desperate to lock myself in, but there was no key. I got back into bed, pulled the blanket right up to my chin and lay there listening to every sound, eyes fixed on the door, heart thumping wildly. At home, I had shared a bed with my mother and Lihu, so it was strange all of a sudden to have a bed to myself, a bed with a proper mattress and pillow. As the room grew brighter, I looked around. The walls were painted white. The curtains were decorated with white cranes flying across a pale blue background, the same colour as the blanket. There was a small wooden table with a lamp on it, a sink in the corner with a mirror above, a low chest of drawers, a wooden chair, and on the floor was a beautiful silk rug. This is your room, Mr Chen had said. It was a pretty room, a clean room, a finer room than any I'd ever seen before. This is my room, I tried out, rejecting the idea even as I said it. I was beginning to swelter under the weight of the blanket, and curiosity was getting the better of my fear of intruders. With one swift movement, I thrust the blanket aside, leapt across the room and peered out through the curtains. We were miles up in the air. I'd had no idea. A dull mist clung to the dozens of bright white apartment blocks on either side, and hovered eerily below. It was thin enough for me to be able to make out the decrepit tops of older apartment blocks on slopes further down. Around and beyond them lay a vast, desolate, rubble wasteland. Where was this place? I wondered. Not a hint of colour punctured the loud whiteness of the new apartment buildings, the mottled white of the mist and the blotchy greyness of the older landscape. I felt as though I were looking out on a ghost city where some unimaginable catastrophe had occurred. A loud knock brought me to attention. It is eight o'clock, Lucianne, called a woman's voice. Come and have your breakfast. However much I was anxious about what I would find outside my room and beyond, I was hungry enough to allow my stomach to lead. I opened the door slowly and peered into the hall, which disappeared round a corner in one direction. It was deserted, but a delicious assortment of smells wafted by, and noises were coming from the other direction, not too far away from my room. I walked cautiously towards them, skirting round two other doorways in case they opened. When I reached the end of the hall, I hesitated outside a half-open door, waited for a loud banging to stop, then knocked gently. Come in, child, said the woman's voice. I stepped nervously into a brightly lit kitchen. It was full of the sort of equipment I had only ever seen before in shop windows. On a table in the middle of the room, a porcelain bowl, bowl and soup spoon and a pair of chopsticks were waiting expectantly. Mrs Chen, for I assumed that's who she was, appeared from behind a cupboard door. My jaw dropped with astonishment when I saw her. She was extraordinarily beautiful, immaculately dressed in the finest silk and pearls. She seemed to have stepped straight out of the pages of a magazine. She looked me up and down, her steady gaze making me feel thoroughly shabby. But she suddenly smiled and said, You are like a fragile reed. One puff of wind and you will break in two. We need to feed you up, Lucianne. Sit down and eat. She gave me a hot, moist towel with which to wipe my hands and face, then brought a bowl of soup followed by dishes of chicken, vegetables and rice. So much food, and all for me, since it seemed that I was to eat alone. While I filled my bowl with soup, Mrs Chen sat down in silence at the other side of the table. I began to eat, but became aware that she was watching my every move. 
which made me feel awkward and clumsy. Though I tried to remember everything I'd been told about good table manners, I failed to stop a dribble of soup stealing down my chin. I wiped, at it, I wiped it as furtively as I could on the back of my hand, only to glance up and see that Mrs Chen's lips had pursed briefly with disapproval before settling again into their charitable smile. When I helped myself to rice, a cluster of grains fell onto the table. The lips pursed again. I wish she would say something, anything, rather than just sitting there watching. All pleasure in the meal evaporated under Mrs Chen's critical eye. I had never even eaten, I had never eaten better, but I had never enjoyed a meal less. I ate as much as I was able, not daring to leave too much in case it was taken as an insult, then smiled timidly and said, Thank you, Mrs Chen, that was delicious. We'll soon tidy up your manners, Mrs Chen replied, smiling back. Now, when you've finished washing up, I'll take you to have your hair cut and buy you some new clothes. With that, she sailed out of the kitchen, leaving me to discover for myself the sink piled high with dirty pans and dishes. I wasn't used to a tap that delivered hot water, so I immediately scolded myself. Nor had I come across something called washing up liquid, which I found by the sink. I read the label, and as directed, squirted some into the running water. Then I gave a few extra squirt squirts in case I hadn't put in enough. I watched with amusement as the bubbles appeared. Then horror as they frothed over the side of the sink onto the floor. I grabbed a cloth and tried to wipe up the mess, but water began to overflow as well because I'd forgotten to turn off the tap. Some of the pans were very sticky. I scrubbed them hard, then left them to drain while I attacked the dishes, which, when clean, I balanced on top of the pans. One of them slid to the floor with a resounding crash, which summoned Mrs Chen. She found me rooted, panic-stricken to the spot, surrounded by hundreds of pieces of broken porcelain and rivulets of water. She looked at me, at the porcelain scattered all over the floor, and beyond me to the pile of dishes and pans. She picked up a pan, inspected it, put it down, picked up the cloth which I had used to wipe the floor, inspected it, put it down. The cloth is for drying dishes, she said. Oh, I'm so sorry, I muttered. There is a broom in the cupboard. Be sure you sweep up every last splinter. We wouldn't want to cut ourselves, would we? No, Mrs Chen, I mumbled. The pans will need washing again, she continued. It's early days. I'm sure you'll do better next time. Yes, Mrs Chen. I swept and swept the floor every last millimetre of it, until I was sure Mrs Chen could not possibly detect even the smallest fragment of porcelain. Then I scoured and scraped and scrubbed the pans, before drying them carefully on a clean cloth. When Mrs Chen reappeared, she didn't look at the floor or the plan pans, simply glanced at the table, pointed out a grain of rice and asked me to wipe it up before we went out. As I stood beside her in the lift, smothered by the strength of her perfume, I felt thoroughly confused. I was in the most beautiful apartment, with a room of my own, eating the most delicious food I had ever tasted, going out to buy the first new clothes I had had in years. Things could have been a million times worse, yet I was full of foreboding. It seemed I was there to do exactly as Mrs Chen wished, to be shaped and moulded in whatever way she saw fit. I didn't want to have my hair cut. Why should I have my hair cut just because Mrs Chen said I had to? But I didn't dare defy her. Her smile was barbed. It failed to touch her eyes, where I sensed pitilessness lurking not far below the surface.